Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, and once again, I'm super glad to be here with you again for this week's episode, which is all about the secret to midlife balance. Sounds interesting, right? I mean, who doesn't love a good secret? (laughs) Here's the thing with midlife balance. It seems to be a complex issue that shows up in many parts of life. Now, I'm not talking about physical balance or toppling over or losing your balance. I mean, life balance. We don't have it. It doesn't feel good when it's off. We complain about it all the time. And for sure, it's something we want. So we're going to go deep into that whole thing. That's what we're talking about today. But before we dive in, this episode is sponsored by the 50 Unplugged Mastermind. Have you heard about it? It's the best way to help you focus on what you can do at this point in your life instead of what you like to think about, which is what you can't do. It's really about becoming bold and brave in midlife, making sure you don't have regrets and finally putting yourself first so that you know what you want and exactly how to make it happen. And one of the best parts is that you get to do this work with an amazing small group of women who are just as committed as you are about getting excited about their lives. Sounds too good to resist, right? I know what you mean. Head over to talktosusie.com and learn more. When you go to the link, you can grab your kickstart call so that we can talk about if it's a good fit for you. And if you join now, you'll also be able to come to an upcoming retreat in Toronto in July that's coming up fast. It is all included. So go ahead, book your no obligation call at www.talktosusie.com and let's see if this is a good fit for you. Okay, let's dive into today's topic. I have to say, working with women in the middle the way I do, it is so easy to see some pretty consistent themes about what is bugging you at this age. It's the same thing that was bugging me. Something is off. Sometimes you have a sense of what it is and sometimes you don't. But one of the most common things I hear from clients and women in my free Facebook group is that they have a work-life balance problem. Sometimes it's work, sometimes it's life, and often it is the combination of the two. The balance in life is out of whack. Can you relate to this? Even if you don't work outside the home, it's pretty much the same thing. Now, I don't have to tell you that there is a ton of work that you do in the home. Maybe a good way to look at it is that it's work that you do for others, right? Either as an employer or in service to others or housework that you're in service of for your family. (laughs) It's all work. So. That is the work part of the life balance. What about life? This could be family life, your relationships, time to yourself, downtime, that sort of thing. That's really the gist of things. And like I said, I hear it over and over again. There seems to be more work and less life, a balance problem. That's pretty much it. That's the overarching issue. Now, there are a few other themes that my clients talk about being off (laughs) and related to this whole situation. Women our age seem to be unclear about purpose in life. It's described in many ways, though, and it doesn't always sound exactly the same, but I think it really is. Kind of like this. I don't know what my purpose is. I'm not even sure what I'm passionate about. It feels indulgent to spend time on myself, so what's the point of even focusing on this? Right? (laughs) My experience coaching on these issues is that you usually do know what you feel strongly about what you're passionate about, what really lights you up, but something gets in the way. Being clear on your purpose is really important because it can guide life decisions. It can influence your behavior, what you do. It can help you shape your goals. It can offer a sense of direction. It can also create meaning in your life, like real fulfillment, living in alignment with what's important to you. Now, I know every time I say alignment, I think it sounds like it's like coming straight from an Oprah magazine. But you know what? Oprah knows what's going on. (laughs) And alignment is a real thing. So what I see is that with help, with coaching, with guidance and exploration, most of you do have a sense of what your purpose is. But the disconnect is that you're not doing it. Again, out of balance. And I remember when I really sensed that this was out of balance for me. 
I had a long-term job. I really liked it most of the time I was there, but about 15 years in, I started to get this feeling that I'm talking about now, midlife unbalance. But I didn't know what it was. What I did know was that I wasn't as content as I normally was. I was typically a very content and happy person. I complained to my friends. I was bored and frustrated. I started searching for answers. The Google, right? (laughs) I was in a midlife funk about the whole thing for about five long years, and they were long. I couldn't figure the whole thing out, but I did figure out my purpose in that phase. I didn't know it was my purpose at the time, but it really was. It became more and more clear to me that something was missing and what it was was working directly with people. My job was more project management based. I loved the creative part of it. I was in a book publishing department, right? It was a lot of fun. I loved that no two days were ever the same. I loved that it was cause oriented. I loved that I was helping people, but I realized that I wasn't helping or working people with directly, and it really started to bug me. Um, I also realized that I was really good at it. And when I looked back over my life, I saw that I was always good at it. I got a lot of satisfaction from it. I chose uh, university degrees that were related to it. I had excellent listening skills. I was a good problem solver. Yet, this wasn't part of the work that I'd been doing for 27 years. I found the missing link. I found my purpose, but I didn't really understand the extent of the problem or the solution. Now, in both of these cases and examples of an unbalanced life, you can see that number one, having more of an emphasis on work than life is part of the problem. And number two, not prioritizing, focusing on your purpose in life is the other part. You're left with a big case of midlife being off or out of alignment, and it is painful. So how do you know this is you? Are you thinking about it right now? Are you reflecting? Well, like I said, sometimes you feel like something's not quite right. You're off, but aren't really sure what the problem is. Or you might have a glimpse of what you want and even spin about it, like you might catch yourself spinning, thinking about it, but you feel confused about making it happen. The other thing is you might whine to your friends on the regular about how unhappy you are. That was me. You might feel really frustrated because you sense there's more out there for you too. That's another thing. You might even start searching for clarity and guidance. Maybe that's even how you found this podcast, looking for some insight on Google or on iTunes. Maybe you were looking for midlife crisis. Lots of people call this phase a midlife crisis. Actually, I don't like the term midlife crisis. I prefer to think of this as a transition of the universe nudging you to stop wasting time and focus on your life already. Focus on living your life more fully or finally recognizing the need to put yourself first. The other thing is you working hard to adjust the important elements of your life into a balance that works beautifully for you so that you have more peace, so that you have more fulfillment and more passion, right? So that's what I think is going on in this transition. Now, you might be wondering, how did your life slip into being so unbalanced at this point anyway? And I think it's a combination of age and stage. It's a combination of the elements in your life that have stayed the same and also changed dramatically. Now, by the time you're a woman in the middle, you might be in a long-term job You might be in a long-term relationship or marriage. For some, that's good. And for others, not so much. (laughs) And at the same time, there's a lot changing. Your kids are growing up and out. Your parents are aging and may need more help. Maybe they've downsized and moved. Maybe you've downsized and moved, relocated. Your friend circle may have shifted or changed. Perimenopause and menopause are now part of the picture. People who you know and love may have gotten sick or maybe even died. You may have had to deal with an illness yourself. So much changing during midlife, and it's a huge transition for sure. It's quite an unpredictable phase of life. So what does this all mean? Now that you're out of balance, what can you do to get back into balance? And this is where I have good news, my friend. I've got the secret. I'm going to give you some solid insight about how to find your midlife mojo and get things into alignment. So here we go. I think it's all about the three P's of midlife balance. 
And the first P is purpose. You have to explore and understand your purpose. It's not going to happen by accident for most people. I think most of you make this way too complicated, way more complicated than it needs to be. So if you're not clear what your purpose is, start here. I'm going to ask you some questions and you think about it. What do you want your life to be about? What do you want to do? Not because you have to, but because you want to. What lights you up? What has it always been? What patterns do you see in your life? And what has always brought you joy? Always. What would you care about no matter what you were doing or where you were working or how you were contributing? How would you spend your time if all of a sudden you had a day off with absolutely nothing to do? What comes to mind right away? What do you love to read for fun? It might be a hobby. It might be the way you volunteer. It might be related to things that you always find yourself Googling. Back to the Google. (laughs) What do you really care about? What are the values that shine through no matter what you're doing? What would you do if you won the lottery? I love that question. Again, what comes to mind right away? What would you do if you won the lottery? Pay attention to that. Now, the answers to these questions will shine a big flashlight on your purpose. If you really want to have fun with this, there's one more thing you can do. Try to boil it down to one sentence. And here are some examples again of this. Now, you can borrow one of these just to get started. I think it's more important to just focus on something and try it on for size. You can always change it. So what about this? I want to be a patient and loving mom. I want to create art. I want to contribute and show up for the charities and causes that I believe in. I want to be an amazing friend who can be relied on and counted on. I want to work in a career that helps people. I want to clean up the oceans. If you don't have enough purpose reflected in your life and what you do, you will likely feel like something's missing and out of balance. So really give this stuff a try. Pay attention to what came up for you. Try on a purpose for size and see how you do. Okay, the second P, pleasure. If you're out of balance, I can pretty much guarantee you are not pursuing enough pleasure in your life. Pleasure is the feeling of happy satisfaction and enjoyment that is used or intended for entertainment rather than business. You have to be intentional about pleasure. It's not going to happen by accident. It's another example of another thing that is not going to happen by accident. It might feel indulgent at first too, so you may resist in a bit, but it is critical. In fact, I love what life coach Susan Hyatt has to say about pleasure. She even says that it's important to diversify where you're getting your pleasure, diversification. Now, I know that the concept of pleasure is often tied to sexual pleasure, and that's okay. You can also think about that. It can be part of it, but not all of it. Her point is that your life should be full of pleasure in a broad way. Everything from textures and fragrances and flowers to meaningful projects at work and laughter and art and books and conversations, all of it. Orgasms too, you can throw that in, but things that fill up your heart. One reason that this is so important is because then you don't have to fill up in other ways with things that feel good superficially but aren't feeling good really. Like overeating, for example, or anything else you might think of as needing or to use as comfort or distraction or to calm down. She says that when your life is full of pleasure, you don't crave other things like this to fill you up or satisfy your emotional needs. So good, right? In fact, Susan Hyatt has a new book called Bear that's amazing and highlights this philosophy, and I highly recommend you check it out, and I will post the link in the show notes because it really is amazing. Here's another cool thing about pleasure. There's actually some science around a way to get even more pleasure about what gives you pleasure, to amplify it. Now, as humans, we have a biological adaptation called essentialism, which psychologist Paul Bloom describes as a particularly clever and important adaptation that drives us to focus on the deeper aspect of things. How we think about things and how we react to things is part of amplifying pleasure. Bloom suggests that if you want to enhance 
the pleasures of your everyday life, one simple way to do this is through knowledge, to actually learn more about what you enjoy so that you can go deeper and have more pleasure. So if you want to enjoy fishing, the trick is to learn more about fishing. If you want to enjoy bird watching more, you should learn way more about birds. I do that. I love bird watching, and it's not like I'm an expert in birds, but I go out of my way to learn how to make my backyard more of a bird sanctuary. <laughs> so we've got bird feeders. We have different types of bird feeders. We have different types of bird seed. We have a bird fountain, and one of the most pleasurable things that I've got in my backyard lately is this amazing little bird fountain in the bird bath. It's this solar-powered bird fountain. I may have talked about this before, but I get a huge amount of pleasure making all of this happen and learning how to attract the birds and how to make it less exciting for the squirrels, or we have some squirrel entertainment in the backyard too, <laughs> all of it. But now that I know more, I really do find it more pleasurable and more interesting. It's super, super fun. Now, the history of things also adds more value to them. This is interesting, and this also translates into more pleasure. And another way to look at this is to think about examples of how much more people would pay for something, right? How much more people would actually pay for something that was once owned by someone famous? So if you really like fashion, you might be attracted to a gown worn by someone famous. And if, it, if this gown was worn by someone famous, it might attract a higher um, uh, amount of money. Or for example, if you're really into music and guitars, it might not even surprise you that John Lennon's acoustic guitar sold for 2.4 million. So when things are owned by someone famous, people would pay way more money to purchase them, to have them. It's another example of how the history of an item adds more value if you appreciate the value, right? If that history is of interest to you. And the bottom line here is that the more understanding you get of the thing that you already get pleasure from in the first place, the richer your experiences can actually be. I love that. I love that. So I don't know what it is for you, but sometimes in life you do get the opportunity to purchase something or to own something that has a particularly interesting history or even you don't have to purchase it, but just experience it. And that history of it just makes you appreciate it, value it, and get more pleasure out of the whole thing. Okay, so those are the first two Ps. Now, what about the third P? The third P is play. I love this one. Play is super important in so many ways. And you don't just need to be silly to enjoy and appreciate this this third P, <laughs> how important play can be in your life. Um, the type of play that's acknowledged in our society is really about competitive play. So you know how much sports are appreciated in our society and how much of our culture watches sports and engages in sports. So if you're not a sporty type of person, if you're not in a family that watches a lot of football or baseball or basketball or that sort of thing, or if you don't participate in competitive play yourself or have kids that do, then, you know, you might feel a little bit disconnected from play. Maybe play isn't as much a part of your life, or at least you don't think that way. But Dr. Stuart Brown of the National Institute for Play, can you imagine there is a National Institute for Play? <laughs> he compares play to oxygen. He actually said, and I quote, it's all around us, yet goes mostly unnoticed or unappreciated until it's missing. Now, does this surprise you that play is that important? He talks about play quite broadly. It includes things that you might typically enjoy but not think of as play, like reading a book or watching a movie, enjoying comedy, maybe giving yourself time to daydream, for example. One of the things I love doing, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get caught in that Facebook or YouTube vortex of Ellen videos. I never catch the Ellen show live, but wow, when I have a chance to watch those videos, I get sucked right in and I have a big smile on my face. I often end up crying too, but 
I don't know. I love those Ellen videos. She is so silly and she has so much fun at her job and it is such a pleasure. She knows how to play. So play isn't just goofing off like that favorite uncle who always says, pull my finger. (laughs) It's not just about being silly and goofy like that. And it's also not just about hardcore sports. Another trend that's really interesting is that there's more research uh, looking into play and adults. So traditionally, it's been well documented with children, but recently there's much more of a focus on the importance of play with adults. And the thing is, too, that play looks different with adults. And it looks different for different people. But adult play does have something in common, even though there are so many differences. There really are themes. It's about being engaged and enjoyment, pleasure, and experience. It's about the experience that takes the person doing the play, the person playing, out of sense of time and place so that the player can actually lose him or herself in it. And the experience of doing it becomes more important than the outcome. And I'm sure that you can relate to that, that when you're involved in play, you're not really worried about the outcome. You're just in it. You are in it. You're deep in it. I love that. And I also love the way this kind of reminds me of the concept of flow, the way flow has been described about being fully in the zone and happily immersed in what you're doing. If only we could have more of that in our lives, right? Now, there's more and more research being done on this topic, as I mentioned, and although some people may appear more playful than others, the researchers say that we're all wired by evolution to play. We are wired to play and be playful, and There are different kinds of play that help us in so many ways. It stimulates your mind. It boosts creativity. It has been found to stimulate imagination. And believe it or not, this type of stimulation can really help you solve problems. It's even been related to improving relationships and communication. So there's a lot involved in play. And I just like whenever I say play, it's so funny I don't know that I've thought about this friend I had when I was a little kid in decades. But when I was seven or eight, uh, we moved and I met a girl who lived in my neighborhood. She lived up the street and we became we became really close friends. And, you know, this is one of the few friends I have from childhood that I've never been in touch with again. We completely lost touch. Her name was Judy. And one of the things I recognized even as a young child was how playful and funny she was and how much I appreciated that. And I guess, think about yourself. Who are the people in your life that you've always appreciated? And I wonder, I bet some of them are playful and you've noticed it. It wouldn't surprise me at all. So clearly, play is an important part of the human experience. There's tons of evidence to show that when you have more play in your life, you're generally happier. And so, my friend, there you have it, the three Ps of midlife balance. And I want to give you the heads up, though. It's not all fun and games when it comes to play and these Ps. There's something you really have to be on the lookout for when you're focusing on pleasure and play and purpose and getting more balance back in your life. And it is the feeling of resistance. So if you see that even with all of this increased awareness of what you want and what the secret is to getting there and you're still not taking action, there is a thought that you're thinking that is most likely creating resistance or doubt. And that is what's getting in your way. So please don't ignore this. But don't be at the effect of it automatically either. Notice what's going on. Now, as a student of this podcast and of mindfulness work in general, You are becoming a watcher of your thoughts. You're separating yourself from your thinking. You know that you're not your thoughts. Now, you can be curious about the way you're thinking, and that is a great way to be because then you can decide if you like your reasons for pulling back. Being reflective like this can really help you live intentionally. This is highly recommended because you don't want to make decisions out of fear or from being unaware and on autopilot. So what do you think? Could it really be this simple? Could it really be? (laughs) Now that I've shared the secret to midlife balance, purpose, 
pleasure and play will help you find the equilibrium you are craving. Add a lot more of these ingredients to your life and you will have more confidence, you'll have more fun, and you will have much less to complain about. (laughs) So that's it for this episode. My focus as a midlife coach is to help you get excited about your life again. I am really serious. This means that you have to get better at thinking on purpose. You have to get better at being the queen of your brain domain. And I'm excited to hear what you do with all of this helpful info. I love getting your emails, so keep them coming at info at susierosenstein.com. Check out the show notes with more information and links at susierosenstein.com. Just click on the podcast tab. And remember to check out my free Facebook group, The Women in the Middle Community at www.facebook.com forward slash groups, women in the middle community. It's for women just like you. We're just waiting for you to join us. And you can also check out a free ebook that I have for you called Nine Secrets to Get Unstuck in Your 50s. Just go to susierosenstein.com forward slash nine secrets. So many secrets. Finally, if you like what you've heard on today's episode, just head over to the Women in the Middle podcast on iTunes and leave me a review. It is greatly appreciated. It helps more women find the podcast. And remember, the more stars, the better. Let's do this, ladies. One bold, brave, and balanced thought at a time. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.